Uh, his name is Robert Beckstrom. Uh, he's a games producer with more than 15 years of development experience. Uh, also, he's an angel investor and CEO of the indie incubator Aurora, Pran uh, Aurora Punks. And today he will share with us his case of the first year of living of indie studio. Uh, please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Valery. Uh, so yeah, as, as um, uh, Valery said, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I was, uh, I was actually attending Games Gathering last year and it was a great time. Uh, obviously the situation now is a bit different with COVID-19 and everything. Uh, so, but I'll see, I'll try to do the best <laughs> to do this online presentation. Unfortunately, my camera is not really with me today, so you just have to make do with this with this uh, uh, slideshow. Uh, so, when I I was thinking about to talk about what, what to talk about today, it's it's sort of a, a very uh, it's it's a subject that's quite wide and it's not really super easy to 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 um, to be to become very substantial about, but I think there's quite a few different approaches you can take to it. But in general, it's 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 about starting games companies. And, and I've been part of starting a few of them. And also sort of how to manage the challenges that lies ahead. And I, I choose to call it, don't put all your eggs in the same basket, which is basically risk minimizing. And uh, I guess that's how you survive as an indie. But actually, what as you will see, by risk minimizing, you will actually be forced to take a few risks as well. But but uh, yeah, I'll get into that later on into the presentation. So um, I wrote this based on 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 a an, a thought I had, which is that. Not every uh, so I was talking about, yeah, let's just dive back to the thing. I was talking about like how not every game is a commercial success. So not even every second or fifth or even 10 tries. In fact, the reason why a lot of publishers actually sustain and are sustainable with their games is because they have the, the financial or, or power to sort of endure games that might not be or super successful and eventually they, they'll find those those um, golden treasures that that takes them to the next into the next fiscal years and i mean that's the same that's been for the music industry for for year, years as well uh and obviously if you start your own in the studio and you if you you you, you need to cope about uh, cope with that you need to find a way to sort of <laughs> to to accommodate that fact that 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 your games might not be that successful from the beginning and and this is a little bit what we with limit break and aurora punk's been trying to 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 sort of achieve or or solve uh, and uh, but i mean there's obviously a lot of different ways you can approach this and i'm not saying this is is uh, is the only truth out there but but um i think uh, there's a few things that we we do and learn that is is useful for everyone. So I'll be a little bit hasty now because of the the tech issues we had. So so just a little bit about myself. I've been uh, in the games industry for for more than fifteen years. I was part of the founding team of Fat Shark, where where I spent a good good majority of my 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 games career. Uh, working as a as a producer uh, on both console and PC games, uh, mostly for our in-house projects. But uh, Rafi uh, Fatshock even did also did work for hire or or games for other for external publishers. Uh, by 2019, I joined Raw Fury and worked there for one and a half year, and and it was more from the publishing side. As you can see, I've been doing a few games, mostly in the like double A or in this seg segment. And uh, to be honest, that's where my where my uh, passion is. 
Uh, and uh, I left Raw Fury August this year uh, to focus fully on Aurora Punks, which I'm the founder of. Uh, and and also just right now I'm standing as the CEO for Limit Break, the studio as well. So a little bit about Aurora Punks. Uh, so Aurora Punks is, is, a, is a, we call it a collective, while it could be, you could call it an incubator investor as well, but we t tend to see us doing more than just investing money and it's a launch pad for micro indies micro indies is, is studios with we, we define them as less than 10 people but i guess that's a little bit give or take uh and basically what we're trying to to solve with aurora punks is the fact that you might have a great idea and you approach an investor or publisher with that idea they will come back and say like um this sounds great do you have a build for us and and that prototype can sometimes be quite difficult for you to achieve, especially since nowadays you find that the 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 expectation of that prototype are growing rapidly. Like the tools we have and the, the quality of those prototypes needs to be higher and higher. And it can be really difficult to achieve on your own funding, like you're working with sweat equity or, or something. And that's where Aurora Punks comes in. And if there's an idea we believe in will will actually help you with that early funding but not only that we also want you to we work closely with you in a, in a what we call the collective of our teams and and sort of help out with knowledge and network and and uh, uh like is the fact trying to counter the fact that if you're a small studio it's you're vulnerable but if we work together you we've got strength in numbers so that's a little bit about Aurora Punks. And uh, if there's something that's interesting for you, just feel free to reach out. There's some contact details in there afterwards. And you can see there, there's a few studios we're working with as well. Uh, I think the most famous one of those is Upstream Arcade, who last year released, or early this year actually, released West of Dead uh, on both PC and consoles. Uh, I should mention we're focusing mainly maybe on indies on the, on like premium premium indie games for PC and console but I mean we're not we're not strangers to mobile either even though like mm, free to play mobile is maybe not our expertise <laughs> uh so here's a few of the titles we are working on a few of them like Western Dead in 1993 is already released while the others are, are in, in development right now. Some of them are not announced yet, so you actually get a sneak peek here from them. Uh, so within Aurora Punks, Aurora Punks is the, is, is the, as I mentioned, the collective, but I'm also working with a studio called Limit Break, which started 2019. And uh, a lot of the things that I'm, I'm talking about here is things we're testing with Limit Break. And, and we are the first studio that Aurora Punk created or, or start working with and we became the largest as well but when we started we was three people up in the northern part of sweden uh, who came together and uh, we we basically came together mostly because we had the, the vision of us working as a team rather than having a specific project we wanted to, to work on and i think that's an important lesson for us like I think the team is always more important than the projects you're working on because the projects will come and go. Some will fail. Most of them will fail. Some will succeed. But the team, if you manage to upkeep the team and, and build a, a strong team, that's obviously uh, like, I think that's one of the uh, great sources for success, actually. Uh, so our first game was 1993 Shenandoah, which was a port of an old PC game that we took to the Switch and gave us a lot of good mm, lessons and knowledge from that. Uh, we also, and this is important, we also combine it with work for hire. And that's something we did when I was with Fat Shock as well. We always combine working on our own games with work for hire. And that's something, especially if you, if you can keep work for hire within the games field and if you can sort of not only uh, co having few of your resources consulting but maybe having your whole team working on something uh, as a work for hire that's super good because it builds your team builds your knowledge and also increases your cash flow uh, 
So now we're actually 16 developers and we quite remotely set up. We are divided on six different cities. Uh, some of them are working alone, but some are like in small teams, like three to four people. And where appropriate, we have offices that have obviously been empty for a while now. But we are basically handling all our com communication through Discord and, and uh, online, uh, online tools. And uh, that's a great strength, which I think every... <laughs> like, if, if you manage to build a company culture where you don't are uh, relying on people being in the same place, it's such a great strength for you because suddenly you can cover all time zones. You can uh, attract the talent you need from wherever where it happened to be uh, a surplus of, of, of talented people. And, and um, in general, you're just less, uh, less vulnerable for, for like local changes to, to anything. So uh, that's, a, I mean, that's, I think it's one of the greatest strengths of any uh, in the studio to be able to, to sort of be remotely set up or not being tightly uh, like tightly connected to one place and and obviously it's also like a cost reason because you don't have to upkeep large or like a, a like an office space or, or things like that um, we're still working on on a, quite a few in-house projects and that's another thing i want to point out uh, in the talk is like it's not only working on in-house projects but also trying to work as, as many in-house projects as possible uh, uh, what we're looking into now is is sort of why we started out. We thought we were main, mainly going to look for publishers for our game, but we're more and more leaning towards self-publishing uh, for a few reasons, which I'll go into. But but and that's what we sort of when we recruiting people to the team now. We're sort of trying to see where we want to go with the team and and making sure we have the capability of, of, of taking care of the whole publishing process as well. So when you start a studio, obviously the team or the teams of it is, is the core of it. And I think the guys of it all is like projects come and projects go, but it's all about the team. And and I think when you, if you think about that, when you, when you recruit, people to your team or when you decide on how to work with or who you work with be very strategical don't just look on what the, pro the projects you have at hand but also try to see what in a like foresee the future a little bit uh where where like where will the needs of the business be in a few years is it unity developers is it the effects artist is it like what 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 is it that we will have and also keep in mind that you should not only work, focus on your own projects you need revenue shares that happens uh, revenue streams that happen along the way with your own projects and i think how you set up your team is super important for that like if you have a few of, like obviously C++ programmers that are really good on network and, and, and optimization is, is very easy to sort of get work, use as work for hire. And the, the money they bring in can obviously maintain a larger team that can work on your in-house project. So it could be good for you to sort of be having, trying to get more developers within a field where you can sort of expect to more easily uh, have them working as consultants then maybe other fees like game designers or, or or writers or even artists nowadays is a bit more tricky to 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 lease out and uh, i think that's really important that you think strategically and not only at the project when you build your team and i mean for us we always i think skill sets from the people in the team can be tweaked along the way but like if they have the passion and uh, a shared vision on where you want to go that's really important and also make sure to build build the environment where they stay because you really want people to stay long in within the, the company in the team so maybe look into uh, employee uh, shared options programs etc et just to make sure that they they staying with you is, is i think it's super important as well 
So when you have the team set up and you have like a structure for that, obviously you need to work on, on in-house projects, the games. And uh, I mean, because that's where the, the value of your company will, will be is your original IPs or at least IPs where you have a, a, a rev share deal on. And especially, and maybe only if you self-publish because you need to keep the control of these IPs. And IPs is the real commodity of the studio. Uh, but uh, I mean, just an IP is, is really difficult to build as well. Like the value of an IP, you, you, you need to put in a lot of work and some timing and some luck before an IP takes off. But there's still, there's no, there's no shortcuts for wh where the value comes from. Even though you, you have a team of 100 consultants, it's only, the, uh, the limitations of if you only do work for hire is, is, is it's a hard cap on how much value you can build into the company. Uh, but with IPs being so difficult to, to, to develop, one could argue that you should stick to one and try to find the one that's really, like being really uh, thoughtful before you decide to move on with an IP and, and really try to find the one and then put all the resources on that one to make sure it becomes a success. But I argue that doesn't really help. I mean, even even the best of IPs are still very successful, uh, uh, still, are very controlled by outer con factors that you can't control. Things like the trends of the industry, timing, just being having the right IP at the right, right place, or, or and obviously some, a lot of hard work as well. But but there's things, there's so many good IPs out there that never took off because, yeah, it just didn't, and people can't tell why. And 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 games are such a hit-driven industry, so it doesn't matter if. What, what, how careful you were with your work for, for reaching there. So to maximize the potential for, for, for getting one successful game, you should try to get as many IPs as possible in, in the making. And I'm not saying that you should take them all to the end, but you should try to build up a way so you can sort of try and, and test as many IPs as possible. And I think the best thing is for that is obviously not just sticking to one IP that you take from the beginning to the end. You, be, you need to be very careful with your KPIs and thoughtful and sort of where are, where, where's the next delivery of this game? And what is the, the sort of gateway we need to take it through before we decide to take it to the next level? And uh, I think there's a few things that a lot of people doesn't do. Like, for, I, I wouldn't be a stranger to sort of just, if I, if I have a game idea and, and it's, a, it's a concept where maybe it's visually quite attractive, I'd probably just try creating a, a trailer and put it out there. While another game with a lot of strength, like a, a, where the gameplay is or game mechanics is really important and I'd probably go away where I'm trying to stick closer to the, to the community and, and right, be very, transparent with what they're doing find all the ways i can to get them involved early and this uh, i mean releasing an early um, feedback build the uh, like a, a beta of some sort there's a lot of platforms out there you can do you can release it on on each or alpha beta gamer i would be careful about releasing it as an early access game on steam because steam is sort of a one shot you get one shot, one chance for a game. I mean, the first release, the first month after release is where you get uh, so critical for a game. So if you release a game that's not really ready yet, you you sort of you're risking hurting it for 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 a long time. So so I uh, will be very careful with releasing an early access build on Steam. I mean, there, obviously there are cases where it's been successful, but there's so many more cases where it's not been successful. And I think there's better ways where you can release it. This Ichio is a, is a great platform that. Alpha Beta Game is, is, a, is a nice resource to use as well to get people try out your build. And obviously get your channels in place, like Discord, have that mail sign up and, and everything. Uh, 
Oh, let's see. What did we map? Don't rush. Okay, yeah. So, as I said, the, the KPIs, the gateways where you take the game is super important. And uh, I wouldn't take a game from one step, like that early access uh, build that I get out, until I get like all the the answers that I would need. And some of the answers is on the game itself, the build and, and getting the feedback. But it's also to see that there's a lot of interest. There's enough interest, enough of people caring about this type of game for me to take it to the next step. So, so I think a demo or a trailer is a good next step for, for that. And, and if that demo doesn't, if people aren't playing it, don't care about it, or that trailer is just not taking off, then I think let that project idling for a while, pausing it for a long time could be something. I'm, I, I'm actually, when I say like, I'm not taking to the next level, it's mostly meaning that I, I'll don't, I don't, uh, it's not like I can it forever. I don't think you should ever can a project, but you, you might, you should put it on pause and always make sure that your team is always like working on something that's closer to, to what's not, like close to, to release or something that's closer to the audience. Uh, but make sure to test the audience with something and never, never ever rush the release of a game just because we got this far just let's let's just finish it and release it because it's it's not yeah it, it doesn't work it's it's just you you're sort of giving away the ip and after after the release it's sort of very difficult to 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 get it back on track again so never rush the release uh, and uh, this is a little bit like yes, I think it's super important when I like you. You need to look at these gateways for the project. This is where I take it next, and after that we take it there. And and you shouldn't push it into the next gateway, ne next section of of its life before you you are f super confident in that you know it will succeed there. Uh, so that's why. Yeah, don't don't rush the release. Don't rush the demo. Don't rush. I mean, an early access and, and and even a coming soon page on Steam is super important. Like, how does it look from the beginning? Like the first impression people get from it. And if if it's something that you put out there with just subpar artwork or or like the 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 copywriting was not directed there, it will stick for them. And it's like, oh, that's game. No, it wasn't anything for me. And the chances for them coming back to that page is, is, is obviously less next time. So don't rush the release. <laughs> that's what I'm super, I think it's most important. Like the key takeaway from, from this talk should be don't rush the release. Uh, so this was a super quick talk I did now just to sort of, uh, save some time for us, but also to allow for for some some questions about it, because uh, I think this 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 is a subject that's better for maybe more it's more adapt for for discussions rather than than just to talk about it. And um, to be honest, this is this talk is mostly I um, just want to open the door for you so you know where to approach me. I put our Twitter. Uh, address there limb break twitter uh, where you find us but you can obviously find us i mean you can find me on linkedin you can find uh, a lot of uh, uh yeah we are present on 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 social media as well and if the, if there's any questions just feel free to reach out to us because there's like this is a, a subject i'm i feel a lot for and i i, I can talk about it for forever and ever uh, okay thank you for your talk robert um, while we are waiting for questions in chat, I do have a lot of questions from my side, actually, because uh, because uh, everything that you told is quite close to what we do. We also uh, kind of small studio and we try to combine a development of our own IP with uh, work for hire. Um, uh, actually, like previously, I hear it a lot of times that it's just impossible to uh, to develop, uh, to work on work for her and on uh, like internal projects at the same time, and uh, and we also feel it sometimes as well because uh, uh, because in our case our our games are always 
kind of uh, our contract work always hurt development of our games. How how do you deal with it? How do you manage uh, to split your resources properly? I think it's a matter of like you always you 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 need to you you don't want anyone idling because they're waiting for something else from someone. And it, it's just a matter of having enough moving parts in the whole setup. Like if the, if you have enough different in-house projects, there's hopefully one of the projects that's sort of adapted to to the team members you still have there. And then if you have enough work for higher partners of different types and sorts, you can sort of always find like, okay, we really need our animator right now in-house. So we, we shouldn't uh, let him or her go out and doing work for hire, but actually the, the porting program is not going to be used anywhere like next year. So it's perfect for, for, for that team or, or he or her to do the work here. And, and the important thing here, I think is to, obviously you need to have, that's what I talk about risks. You actually need to have a certain size of the team to be able to do this, because if you just two or three people, obviously there's much, you become much more vulnerable to if someone goes that's a third of the team but if you become like 10 15 people and that could be 10 15 not in working on the one in-house project but working on several then you have more moving parts to tweak with and i think it becomes more easy but I, yeah it's definitely getting past that that level of of uh I need a, a certain number of, of developers to be able to to do this, or being really lucky with the type of work for you hit. And okay. and I mean also maybe I should point out that's where a collective or working together with others is is a is a key point as well because if you start working together with others, you can always maybe find um, resources that can help help each other out, and you can share on on work for higher projects as well, and and sort of making becoming larger than what you are if, if, if you see what i mean okay but you don't have any kind of uh, rules that uh, like this piece of your team works only on contract work this uh, people works on inter I, I mean that you don't have uh, any reserved part of your resources uh, that you invest in your own games I uh, know. I mean, generally, I'm always against rules because rules are based on the context <laughs> that are from a from a certain context, and I think you should always be very flexible to to how the reality looks in the in like in the new context. So it's 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 more of being very flexible. I think that's the one rule. And and obviously, like if if you if you find out the uh, like. You, maybe you can look at the numbers. If you if, if if you work for hire, if you have a team that is sort of relying on on one person or one team resource, and that team resource is 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 working as a uh, as a consultant, and that means the rest of the team can't do anything, and you don't have anything that fits them, then maybe the cost for that work for hire is higher. But mm -hmm. that's why I think you should try to be flexible and really see where can we go. Is there any other one uh, other persons we can can uh, bring in that can cover up for this person or or, or things like that so it's uh, it's just being very creative and flexible that's my one rule i have okay and, yeah and please go ahead. Also another rule another rule i think is important is like pausing a game an internal project is is quite often i think for beneficial for the game because it sort of matures and you know, if you're constantly working towards the next deadline, and you know now we have the funding to this, and we need to reach the beta at this time, and then we need to reach the first playable, like or the first public hands-on beta and stuff like that, you you never get the chance to sort of think about the game and see if the, are we on track here? Is there something we need to sort of? You never let the game mature. But actually, taking a pause and going to doing work on other projects or work for hire is actually quite often beneficial for the game itself because you come back with new eyes and it's like hey this thing was it really that good or someone else tried it for a while and came back and said you should rethink this or maybe they came up an opportunity for the game that wasn't there like six months ago so i think that's okay. a, that's that's a thing to to take with you as well uh we have a question from audience uh about any advice uh how to make a 
a successful uh, funding company on Kickstarter? Um, I think Kickstarter is difficult, especially for, for digital games. I think there's uh, uh, platforms where are, but obviously if you do a Kickstarter, I mean, you need to, uh, there's like, I think a successful Kickstarter is not the one that just reached the goals, but because it's sort of like, you need to make sure that uh, a Kickstarter needs to take off way beyond the the the, the asked money you, you took it, because otherwise you might end up just having co covering covering your costs for up to release. And also like the Kickstarter might be everyone that was sort of gonna buy the game at release. So you're sort of just borrowing resources from yourself. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not super confident in Kickstarters. Uh, I have to admit, I never been I mean, I, I've been part of teams doing Kickstarters, but I've never been working actively with myself. But I, I, I don't know. I know I, I, the one thing I heard is like, if if obviously there's a lot of community work that's needed for it to to take off, and like there's there's really that thing. But I, to be honest, if if possible, I would rather do that work together with other type of funding, <clears throat> or maybe uh, like looking. I guess. You could do it through Patreon or something like that, where where it becomes a little less like all or nothing. I guess it. it I would say it depends a little bit on the project as well. But I'd be really careful with Kickstarter, to be honest. Okay, uh, Vitaly asks uh, about any checklist or benchmark to measure if uh, the game is ready to be launched at, uh, for early access. Um, <clears throat> I think yeah, obviously there's a there's a, I could recommend there's a newsletter called Game Discovery. Co. I can write it in the chat afterwards. It's by Simon Carles, and he talks a lot about like he actually measures a lot of good KPIs on Steam, for instance. And it's I mean you can look at wish list. The wish list is really good because um, to look at because it's very quantitative. It's a, it's a it's a hard number, but it's easy to get distracted by it as well because you think, oh, I have all these wish lists, and and so it means I will reach all the sales on, on at release or early access. But wish lists is, is not like there's different differences in the quality of wish lists as well. So I think you need to look at the general how much bust the game is. Like look at try to measure how much. How much people you got in your Discord? How much people you have on your uh, uh, newsletter sign up? How much people you got actually talking about the game in, in your social media channels? And all of those are sort of difficult to measure, but you need to find ways to sort of put them in uh, in there. And and uh, like I think there's actually uh, there's a good ch chart called Steam Hype Chart that uh, this newsletter compiled, which tells you pretty good on like. Well, what different le levels games are at when they release, and it gives a lot of valuable like input on because it's actually I mean it's it's quite the the connection between the how much interactivity it's it's in the games forum, how many followers and stuff like that you have is that's basically what's going to decide if if the game becomes successful or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from my side: um, What is like? What is your goal for the limit break? Like, uh, how how do you see it in five years? I think I hope we're not gonna grow too much because I I I, I like to stick within like a manageable numbers, and but I hope we will be able to 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 work on a few different in-house projects and and do self-publishing of those and be able to work on on like have enough people to work on on whatever project we find interesting and and not uh, not being just stuck with one genre obviously i think the indie sector is where i think it's most important most uh, interesting because it's quick turnaround times so i don't think we're ever going to go into the triple a market if we really want to do that to just test out the next gen tech or whatever it's more fun to do that as work for hire on a bigger project than to try to achieve it ourselves so we always stick in the in the sector but but being big enough to be able to now 
to have the financial stability for all our projects, making sure that even if not everyone becomes a success and we know it's not going to be, at least one of them will be successful enough to, to support others. Okay, I got it. Uh, I wish you good luck with it. And I hope that maybe in a year uh, you'll give us some update about it. It would be nice uh, yeah. to watch uh, how, how it goes and how it changes. Um, okay, uh, I think we don't have any other questions. Thank you very much. Oh, no, we don't. We have one. Wait. One. The last. Okay. Let, let, yeah. Let, yeah, let it be the, the last one. Uh, huh. Uh, I will probably a little bit change uh, how it's asked. Like, what is the right way to look for funding for the game? Uh, it depends. If you if you have the capability of self-publish, I think uh, there's a lot of like investors that you do that look into. It. It, I mean, that could help you. Uh, it also depends on what stage you are. If you're just having an idea for a game or like an early pitch or concept, then uh, companies like Aurora Punks would probably be the the one way to, to sort of approach uh, mm -hmm. someone. Because the, otherwise, you, you most likely you'll need a build uh, or a playable prototype, or unless you have like a track record of games. So it's a little bit depending on what, what your, your history as a studio, what kind of game it is, and things like that. Uh, but so most of those, but I think the best setup, it's most, it's the most difficult one to attain, but if you reach it, you're golden. And that is to create a company where you manage to use work for hire to, to sort of cover the cost for your in-house projects. Because, because that means that you're not relying on anyone else. Because even if you bring in an investor, they will start they will start expect you to come back with success after a while and they might be the one that pushes you to to release a game early because they want to see return of the investment so if you can sort of set up have a setup maybe try to do a, a, a easier game for like a simpler game like a mobile or something that can bring you a little revenue uh, if if you sort of manage to build a, a a solid base of different small cash revenues games that will help you a lot in the long run because if you can start developing your in-house project without any rush because you don't have any any there's no end to to your funding you might not be able to expand your team but at least you can just give it the time that you need that's that's just then you're good Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have also another question about how big must be team uh, to get work for hire projects. It's all very difficult, but I think the more people you have, the more like obviously the overhead from a work for hire is the, uh, uh, is, the, is, the, is the important one, and like every over like the more people you can have as as work that does work for hire. The, the more the overhead you'll get and the overhead is what can, you can use on your in-house project. So it's, I think the, the bigger, the better <laughs> to a certain extent, I guess. Uh, and also depends a little bit what kind of setup you have. But if, if you have, if you have like a whole team that can work on one project uh, and covering all aspects, I think that's obviously super beneficial as well. Okay. I think that's it uh thank you very much one more time for a talk and uh, yeah. i hope uh, to host you at our event again in future thank you thank you